Oh, hey, as you, as you can see, I'm out on my walk. It's the sun's just coming up. There's a little blue sky there over my shoulder. And as I was preparing this intro for this lesson, <clears throat> I remember August of 1969, watching my dad go out the door in his uniform, headed for a place called Vietnam. Now, 13 months later, he came home. And it was in one piece. But I remember the excitement as it was getting closer to the time of him ending his tour of duty and, and coming home to us. And that's the kind of excitement God has when sinners come home. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 5 where Jesus calls Levi or Matthew to uh, come follow him. And then in the next scene we see a feast at Levi's house. And of course the Pharisees and priests and people are pretty upset with Jesus over this. But he makes the point that you can't put old wine skin or new wine into old wine skins and how the sick are the ones needing a doctor, not the well. And in Luke chapter 5 we can see that there's some excitement. And we need to have that excitement as we call people home, call sinners to come home to God and have that relationship with God through Jesus. So, get your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 5. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just click on that subscribe bar. When the notification bell pops up, click on it. You'll be notified anytime I add content to the channel. Feel free to comment on these videos if you like it. Give it a thumbs up. Share these videos. I can't grow the channel without the help of my loyal viewers such as yourself. All set. Luke chapter 5. And remember, if you're not careful, I might just learn something before we're done. So let's get started. Is that that working? Because I couldn't tell if it was on back there a minute ago. Everybody, everybody hearing me? Yes? No? Don't want to? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> if you didn't see, uh, uh, I just wanted to put this up. We are. Uh, I, I have a, a friend that does design some logos and some branding for us, and these are the three options we have, and we're just trying to get a consensus, a vote. Uh, if you want to uh, cast your ballot back there, these are the three options, and uh, just let us know which one you like. Uh, we're going to pick one, and then we'll be using it for stationery and advertising and things like that. So uh, vote early, vote often, as they say in a certain city not far from here. Uh, when, when, uh, that's all the politics for today. When you, when you were in school... Uh, or when you were a kid, did, did anybody ever play, you know, pick up basketball games or, or football or baseball or dodgeball, the dreaded dodgeball? And uh, typically what would happen is you'd get two team captains, a teacher might pick one, you and you kind of thing, and then they would start picking teams. And you did not want to be last, obviously. Who got picked first? Well, of course, the best. Or if you were really good buddies with one of the team captains, you know, one of them might pick you uh, ahead uh, of the others. But the idea was, you know, I want the best. I want the athletic one. I don't want the uh, nerdy, uncoordinated kid uh, who can't stand up and walk across the, uh, the court at all. And when it got down to the last two or three... You dreaded it really because I might be the last one picked and I can remember sometimes snickers coming from the ones who had already been picked when you got down to those last two or three. Now do you think that kind of mentality could spill over into Christianity? The great thing about Jesus is he didn't pick just the best. He called everybody. He called everybody. The one thing you have to remember is the people he did call were working in whatever their, their respective occupations were. The fishermen were fishing, and the, the man we're going to look at today was doing his job as a tax collector. But 
there are times, it seems, when the church has gotten to where it becomes more like a social club. In fact, in England, in the 1700s, the Church of England, the Anglican Church, had become basically a social club for the, for the wealthy and the well-to-do. The people who could dress in their Sunday best. They didn't want those people from the other side of town to be in. They were treating it like it was a country club uh, with, with, its, with its own private uh, clubhouse, which is what the building had become. And then a guy named John Wesley came along. Wesley said, you know, that's not right. Wesley was basically ostracized out of the Church of England because he would go and talk. He would go to the orphans. He would go to the jails. He, would, he got to where he had to meet wherever he could find a place because he was not very popular in the religious circles. He would go and meet uh, 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 in fields, in barns, even, I'm told, uh, in my reading, uh, would meet in graveyards, if that's where he could get uh, a place to go, where he could meet with folks. And uh, his brother Charles was a prolific hymn writer, and some of his hymns are in our songbook. I think he wrote over 300 hymns, if I'm not mistaken. And what it came down to was that uh, Wesley was actually out there among the, the so-called undesirables and actually taking them the gospel, and he's founded what is, we know today as the Methodist Church, because they, they had a set method of how they did things, and that's how they got the name, was they had a set uh, program and a way they, they, they uh, did their services and their studies. But the idea is that he said, look, we, we're supposed to be taking this to the people who really need it. Now, when you look at the New Testament, one count I read said that four Gospels, how many of them do you think uh, Jesus, when he encountered the people, were in the synagogue or in the temple? Would you believe there's less than a dozen times it's recorded he was in the synagogue or the temple? Six times in the, in the temple, four in the synagogue is uh, uh, one count. The rest of the time Jesus met people, he was out at Jacob's well, for instance. Or he was going to uh, hear a, he, heal, I'm having a hard time today, spit it out, heal a centurion's uh, servant when he felt power go out of him and someone had touched him. And, and, and where was he? He was on the road. And where is he today? He's in a house of a tax collector. Luke chapter 5, he's in that house with that tax collector called Matthew to ministry, or Levi, uh, depending on what, what your translation says, same person. Come and uh, told him, say, hey, come follow me. That's to be about like one of the, how many of us would go down to the IRS office and tell one of their agents, come follow me. That, that's basically, in fact, Matthew arguably would be worse than one of our IRS agents today. But he got called by Jesus to come. The church, it's been said, is not a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. Now, where do we get the museum analogy? Well, think back to what was going on in the Church of England. It had become just a place for them to display themselves, display their new clothes, display their fancy carriages and everything. Sometimes we take church, don't we, to become a place to display ourselves, rather than think about going out into the world and taking this, this, uh, this gospel message to people. And I want to remind people again, remind everybody again of the 25th when we'll have Craig Subi here. This is how we're, uh, one way to go out and take the message that needs to be taken out. Uh, and really, it doesn't matter what method you use. Someone once told me, just know the book. After that, the method really doesn't matter. But this is just going to be one way that we can call sinners home and call them to come in. Because Jesus, remember, did offer the ultimate in acceptance. He accepted everybody. He didn't just sit there and pick the best. Okay, you're, you're, you're the best. I'm going to take you. You're, you're good looking. I'm going to take you. You, yeah, not so good looking. Not you. Uh, and then the, over here. He didn't do it that way. Look at what he did. Verse 27. These things he went out and saw a tax collector. And remember, this is a Jewish tax collector working for who? The Romans, and the Romans and the Jews were all good buddies and everybody got along well. Is that right? Yeah, they got along just as well as any other people would with a, with a nation that's occupying their country. They didn't care much for those Romans, did they? And as a tax collector, no less. Going out, they had a, basically a, uh, a certain amount of money they had to collect. Just put it in modern terms, say $100,000 a year. Anything over that was his. 
So just think of all the corruption that could possibly come out of it. Plus, they also collected what we would call duties. You ever gone overseas and you come back into the country? And some things that you've bought overseas, you have to pay a duty or a tax on. Uh, what we would call customs. Uh, sales taxes. There was lots of ways he could hit people for uh, tax revenue. And anything over whatever his um, uh, allotment was, it was his to keep. And there would be some who would do what we would call shakedown artists. You know, organized crime going in and wanting uh, you to pay them for uh, protection, those kinds of, of course, they didn't offer protection, but it was a shakedown. You know, you've got to pay a certain amount. You don't have it, to, I'll be back tomorrow and it's going to be double. Now, there's no indication that Matthew was corrupt or dishonest, but that's the reputation that people in that line of work had. And so publicly, from just a straight-up public uh, 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 setting, he was probably the most unacceptable disciple Jesus picked. Tax collector. He's a betrayer of his people. He is collecting for the Roman. There is no way, Jesus, are you, are you sure you want to do this? And no doubt, as Jesus is going by and saying, come and follow me, he's, oh, you want to hold up, Me? Why would Jesus want me to follow him? And, and the, 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 when, when, when Jesus was, was, saw him, it wasn't just he walked by and just glanced over and said, oh, come. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus had watched him. Jesus saw him, had put, uh, eyed him as he was going, going uh, uh, through and, and recruiting disciples, calling disciples. He saw an evangelist and a rescuer of souls. Now, to do this job, you had to be a little bit aggressive. Anybody ever worked in collections? I, I've known a few people who were basically bill collectors. They were the ones that called you when you were two or three or four months behind. And they could get pretty aggressive. Uh, car repo uh, men. I actually knew in Alaska growing up, I knew guys who had to go around and repossess airplanes. That one really got tricky. But they got to be aggressive. Matthew is someone who is going to be aggressive, but not aggressive now in a bad way. He's going to be aggressive in, in that he's, gonna, he's not going to back down. He's going to stand tough. And that's what Jesus is going to need. And this word for follow means it's a continuous action. He's not just going to the end of the block or going so far and stopping. He's continuing to follow Jesus. He stayed with Jesus for the rest of his life, and, and of course wrote the book of Matthew uh, and that sort of thing. He followed. Jesus saw him. He called him. He got up from his table. Notice he left right away. Got up from his tax booth and went on. Left a very lucrative uh, position, a very lucrative occupation. Now, if we are Christians, not only do we want to tell people about Jesus accepting everybody, we don't want to go to heaven alone, do we? I had a teacher in high school who grew up in a little town in Oklahoma. I think it was about half the size of Danville. And this would have been in the 1940s, early 50s. And they had a drive-in movie. And Monday night was dollar night. Anybody, any car with no, any amount of people could get in for a buck. And so one night his friend was going around picking people up. What else are you going to do? A little town out in the middle of the Oklahoma prairie. Said, so, come on, we're going, to the, we're going to the movies, get in. And they had people in the front seat, back seat. They even had them in the trunk. They had the trunk open. But there were people back there writing, hey, it's a dollar. As long as you're in the car, you get in. It's a buck for the whole car load. Cost everybody probably about 10 or 15 cents to get in. That car was over. How many of you, when you were kids, got it, you know, before uh, we got worried about safety, jumped into the back of a pickup and went across country roads, bouncing up and down? Full. The cab's full, you got 10 people, 15 in the back. That's what we want going to heaven. We want to get up there in that, in that car we're in or whatever vehicle is just loaded and people are hanging on to it. That's what we want. We don't want to go to heaven alone. And that's what, what Levi or Matthew thought. And the re, look at this feast that he's having. It's one of those cultural universals. What do you do if you want to get a large group of people together? Offer food, right? That's what he did. He's got money, being a tax collector. He's got plenty of money. He can go out and get a food and get a setting, get people uh, to serve it. He wants his friend. It's apparent why he's doing this. 
he wants to introduce his friends to Jesus. He wants them to come and hear this guy that's called me. He's changing my life. I want you to come and hear him for yourself. This is, this is really, I believe, if people would actually sit down and read the Bible for themselves and, and study it, I think they would understand and they would get it, rather than seeing uh, the Discovery Channel and uh, Time Magazine and all these other uh, sources where people get their Bible information from. If they really look at it, I think they'll get it. Just like these people who came to hear Jesus. Come here, hear this guy. He's the Messiah. Come listen. Come on here. I, I'm going to have lunch at my house. Come on in. We'll have lunch and you can hear Jesus. They got a pretty good deal there. Got to hear him for themselves and, and understand it. Uh, no doubt, I don't have any problem. Jesus took questions here. But look at the other, the Pharisees. The religious leaders. We got the righteous and sinners. Actually, we could add a third group there. The tax collectors. They were in their own category. They, you, you'll see in there where they talk about the sinners and the tax collectors. That's how bad those tax collectors were thought of. They were way down the, the social list. I think probably the only one that would be lower than them, and I'm not even sure about this, would probably be a shepherd. Shepherds were pretty low on the social ladder. But here these guys are. The righteous, remember, are going to be those who keep the rules. We do everything right. We check it off as we do it. The righteous see themselves as right with God. Why? Well, because I don't do all these things on this list that God says not to do. I, I do all the things over here. I hang out with the right people. I got all, all the friends in the right places. That's how I know I'm righteous. I do it all. I do everything that God expects of me to do. I keep the law. But Jesus wants them to see there's more to it than just that. Why, they're, and so, they're, they're, so they're wondering, so why, why, are you, why, why are you eating with these people? Why, why are, you, are you doing this? They don't keep the law. They don't do anything right. Jesus, you should be with us. That's what they thought. Because we do everything right. They thought that, then we'll see here in just a minute, to be righteous with God meant basically you had to be unhappy all the time. All the get to that here in just a minute. Keep in mind, too, that the only people really who can be saved are those who really realize they're lost, like we have up here, the tax collector and the Pharisee. Were they both sinners in front of God? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isn't that right? But only one of these two men realized it. Have you ever stopped to think about, really, the difference between us and someone who's not a Christian? What's the difference? We've got the blood of Jesus on our sins, covering our sins. We have decided to follow Jesus. Someone who's not a Christian hasn't, hasn't made that decision. Or maybe they've been presented with it and decided not to. Either way, the blood of Jesus is the separating uh, factor here. That's what we have to remember. We're no better or no worse than anyone else. And that's what Jesus wants these Pharisees to understand. It's not good people, bad people. It's people who know that they are bad, who know that they are sinners, and those that don't. We might even say they're kind of in denial. Like that Pharisee with the tax collector. Lord, you know, thank you. I'm not like this loser over here. I, I fast, and, and, and I give a, of all that I earn, and I do this, and I do that. And you might be interested in knowing that, Lord. In case you missed anything, Lord, here's a checklist. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but that's pretty much what he was telling God. Trying to make God impressed with all the things that he did. But the, Ferris, or the, the tax collector is just standing over there. You know, you can tell when someone knows that they've done something wrong or when someone's really ashamed, what do they do? They look at the floor. Or if they're not looking at the floor, they might look over there at the wall. They're not going to look you in the eye. This tax collector is not looking God in the eye. You know, he's not looking up to heaven. He's hiding, hanging his head. You know, they saw Levi and his friends just as, being a, as a bunch of condemned sinners. But Jesus saw them as being people who were spiritually sick, needed the physician. You know, I don't know about you, I'm not crazy about going to the doctor. 
I've never rolled out of bed in the morning and said, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. I think I'm going to go see the doctor today. But there have been days I rolled out and thought, ah, I'm not feeling it today. I need to go see the doctor. I haven't been feeling well the last several days. I'm going to go to the doctor. That's the kind of person Jesus wants. That's the first step. The first step is realizing there's something not right. I need to go to the doctor. There's something not right in my life. I need to go to see Jesus. I need to investigate Christianity. I need to uh, see what Jesus can do to help me get my life turned around. That is the first step, is admitting it. That's what AA and a lot of groups like that say. The first step to taking care of uh, your alcoholism or your, whatever your addiction is, is you have to admit you've got the problem. Everybody around you can tell you you've got it, but until you realize you've got it yourself, there's nothing in the world that can be done about it. There's nothing in the world that can help me uh, uh, become a Christian or get uh, right with God unless I say I need to do it. Everybody around me can tell me all they want, but until I get to that point, there's nothing in the world that can do it. And those who are well or thought of themselves as well are not the ones that, uh, uh, that needed help. It was those, um, uh, those who, felt, uh, who did not feel like they needed it. See, the Pharisees did not feel like they had any kind of need of help. I'm pretty good. These are the people you might approach. It's kind of, kind of the same. And ask them, you start try to talk to them about the Lord, and they say, oh, I'm good, thank you. I, I got it. That, that, that's the Pharisees. Of course, they thought they were good because they were in the synagogue and, and in the temple and, and, and doing the feasts and doing everything they were supposed to do. They had that checklist that they were going down. Yeah, uh, it's uh, the Yom Kippur. Yeah, brought my, my sacrifice here. I went to the temple. I paid my tithe. I did this. I did that. Check, 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 check. And we can get that way too, or it just becomes a list instead of thinking about using uh, what we learn here and when we go away. And then the, we got to look at the joy and service to the Lord. Now, remember, I didn't grow up in a church going home. I had this picture of, of Christians. If it was something fun and enjoyable to do, no Christian's going to want to do it. That was the impression that I had growing up. Because I saw a lot of sour, unhappy people who called themselves Christians. And that's what we're going to see here with the Pharisees. They, they decreed you had to fast twice a week. Usually it was on a Monday and a Thursday. And that was something they expected you to do. And what did they do when they were fasting? When they got to fasting, you know, for one thing, they, to them it was synonymous with mourning. It was something Jesus talked about, how they would go around with long faces, ashing themselves up. They, would, they wanted you to know, hey, I'm fasting. So they were going to make sure that visibly you saw them as, as fasting and as unhappy. And this is where getting into what I said about uh, my impression of churchgoers. They wanted fasting and service to God to be something, or to come across as, as joyless, gloomy. This is what we might do when we say, oh, I've got to go to church. Oh, Mom, do we have to? And I, my sister had a friend who went to uh, one of the churches of Christ in Anchorage, and they, I think it was Halloween, I can't remember now, but they were wanting to do something, and her mother, uh, this friend's mother, vetoed it. And that was basically uh, their attitude was, no, we have to go to church. We have to do it. And it was in a very stern, very joyless, they just acted like they were doing it because we're following orders. There wasn't any real joy there. The idea was you can't be spiritual unless you're uncomfortable, unless you're unhappy. Now stop and think, what do we project when our friends see us? when our relatives see us? Or do we show some kind of joy? Because Jesus wants them to understand, hey, his presence justifies a feast. He wants them to understand that they, there can be joy in serving God. More of a privilege, I get to do it. More of something that, that, that I get to do because, because God, yes, God wants me to do it, but I want to go and serve God. I want to be with God's people. I can't wait to roll out of bed and get down there and, and be in class and, and see what the, the lessons are going to be and sing the songs and praise God because God got me through another week. And God is, is keeping me going in this world that seems to be crumbling down all around me. 
but God is still there being a rock and is, is holding me firm. That's the idea that we should project. That God is, yeah, the world's falling apart around us. I'm holding it together. Why? Because of what God is doing in my life. And in parable form, he's telling them. He has not come to patch up the old. He's coming to give the new. It's not a kind of, any kind of a patchwork religion. He is coming to bring the new. When they heard about Jesus, many of them were just trying to add them to whatever is going on in their lives. They just kind of, here again, comes back to Jesus is kind of a good luck charm and the church is kind of a club I go to. That's not what Jesus wants us to see. This is the fulfillment of the old. It's not an addition. Jesus fulfilled that Old Testament. We need that Old Testament to uh, make, help make sense of the new. You know how sometimes you turn on a show like NCIS, one of those, and you'll hear a narrator say previously on NCIS, and they tell you what happened last week. Think of the Old Testament as kind of that. It's what happened before, and now we're in the New Testament. So you can understand how Jesus is a sacrifice. He is a lamb because they did lambs as sacrifices back in the Old Testament. And we have to understand we don't want to be like the Pharisees and get so exclusive that we forget why we're here that we forget why God sent Jesus. And unfortunately, many times we can get so busy doing things we forget. We've got a commission. We have a job to do. A lot of church activities that uh, we get involved in, a lot of times we forget. Well, we've got to be out among the lost. Go and make, the, go and make disciples. He didn't say to just wait in the church building for them to come. In the old days, maybe when, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, that would have worked. Great building in a great location. Isn't that the three things you need in a business? Location, location, location. And we've got a good location here. But remember, our world's changed. And we can't just wait for people. We've got to go out and bring them. That's calling the sinners home. That's calling them to come in and see the doctor. We use the physician's anal analogy. Bring them in. Show them the joy of being a Christian. Show them what God has done in our lives so that they too can understand it. And those who have not made a, yet a decision to follow Jesus or who have left Jesus, don't ever let an unhappy Christian convince you you've got to give up happiness to, to have joy. Don't ever let a, 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 a mean or, or a bad Christian. There, there are some Christians, let's face it. They're not the most pleasant people to be around. But don't let that stop you. Remember, we're doing this for the Lord. Ultimately, I want to go to heaven. I want as many people to go with me. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that we've got, uh, that, that people are going there. And as Christians, let's do that. Let's go out and bring them in. The only lasting joy, that ultimate pleasure we can find is in Jesus forgiving our sins and we're walking with the Lord. Let's show that joy. Let's show that, that, that happiness and that security we have, that peace we have that we know is going to last for eternity. Take it out and show it. This morning, can we, can we help you with that? Call you home, help you to get there. That's why we're here. Pray for one another. We're here to lift up one another. And if we can help you in any way, let us know as together we stand and as we sing. There's a fountain brief is for you and me. Let us taste the peace to its brink. There's a fountain of love from the source of love, and he bids us all freely drink. We fall through the fountain brief.
some other things in here. Uh, kids' classes. We've got the Bible classes. Uh, new quarter started. We're into the second Sunday. It was today. Uh, if you have not made it to the adult class, from what I hear, it's a good class. I haven't been able to go because I'm teaching the kids down here. But it'd be nice to be in this class, too. I can't be in two places at once. It's crazy. But anyway... If you haven't made it to the adult class, sounds like a good class for everybody to be in. Clyde's teaching. Kids' classes, we have Marty teaching down in the middle elementary class. I'm teaching fifth and up. And then Becky Morris is available to teach preschool as needed. So, that being said, we have classes going on. Wednesday Bible class is starting a new study on Hebrews, which goes to tell you that there is a coffee in the Bible, because Hebrews. Ha! Ah. <laughs> I had to say it, sorry. Anyway. It's a good joke, I thought. Anyway. Uh, that's that's uh, 10 a.m. on Wednesday. I don't know if you guys have coffee in class or not, but whatever. Just an idea. All right. Um, then also, uh, let me see. Upcoming events, I'll go over that real quick. Uh, Schultz was in all day that has been canceled uh, but there is still a way that you can show them your love and support uh, many items ready to sell at our craft booth and we will have these items on display in the fellowship hall on Sunday September 19th so next Sunday you have the opportunity to purchase items after worship service that morning most items cost between one to five dollars with a few little more expensive all proceeds will be sent to Schultz Lewis as mentioned, Amelia, she's got the uh, da, 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 Snow White, Seven Dwarfs show going on. Dates are listed there when she's going to be showing and be there because there is a multicast. Um, then uh, the 25th, Saturday, September, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., encouraged to come out here. Craig Subby, I think that's how you say it, Subby will help us learn how to evangelize. Good news is, everybody gets to come here next Sunday again. Got worship again next Sunday. Be excited. Got to spread the word. Let everybody know that we're here. Uh, with that being said, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord and Father in heaven, we come to you again at this time. Thank you so much for this day you've blessed us with be able to gather together as brothers and sisters to worship you, sing songs of praise, to open your word, to hear a message from you, and be able to learn more about you. We ask you to be with us through this week as we go about our lives and help strengthen us, encourage us, help us to spread your word throughout this community and through those around us in our workplaces and others that we come across. Be with us and strengthen us and guide us. Must we ask in Jesus' name, amen.